Hi everyone, I am excited to break down a new paper about differentiating BPH from prostate cancer. Uh, BPH stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia and why am I talking about it? Well, because I'm proud to be part of this work through the collaboration with researchers from Halcyon Diagnostics and this work is published in the October issue of a journal called Cancers. And Halcyon Diagnostics is a biotech company and they focus on cancer diagnosis and therapeutics using a protein called GASP1 or GASP1 that they have identified. And I think you'll find the, these findings to be quite interesting. Now, for those of you who know me, you know that my interest lies in extracting information, actionable information or actionable data, let me put it that way, from image analysis using Python. Right Now, this is exactly what I have done in this work. My contribution lies in the coding part, like de earring, uh, for example, TMAs, I'll talk about that in a second, uh, digitally separating uh, stains and segmenting nuclei and performing intensity measurements. Uh, you have watched many of my videos on this topic, so hopefully you'll uh, relate to this. Now, if you are a biologist, I'm sure you will relate to this content, and if you're not, I still encourage you to watch this video because you'll learn how your coding skills can be put to use to support groundbreaking research that has potential to affect lives, to extend someone's life, right? Now, researchers from Halcyon, uh, they used this data, you know, that gets uh, at least the one that I extracted to further validate their findings. Now, they published several pa uh, papers in the past uh, describing that, okay, the overproduction of this protein that I just mentioned, GASP1, is required for the cancer initiation and uh, progression and, of course, uh, invasion. Okay, so first let's understand the current challenge. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men. And... It's typically detected using uh, something called a PSA blood test. Now, PSA testing is, of course, it's great. It helped many patients, but it has uh, a major limitation, which means it cannot reliably tell the difference between cancer and the benign condition like BPH that we just uh, mentioned about. So, so what? It leads to many unnecessary biopsies and treatments that result in, of course, significant amount of healthcare costs, but not to mention the pain, discomfort, and other risks to the patient. So let's jump into this, but uh, again, before diving into the findings itself, let's talk about how we analyze the tissue samples. And these tissues come on something called TMAs, tissue microarrays, where you have a whole bunch of these uh, tissue samples on uh, this microarray, and it allows us, why, why is it useful? It allows us to look at multiple tissue samples at once. And RTMA, in, the, in this case, in this study, included samples from healthy prostate, BPH cases, again, these are benign, right? These are not cancer, BPH cases, and the different states, uh, sorry, stages of uh, the cancer itself, of prostate cancer. And these tissues are prepared a couple of different ways, like one is uh, traditional H and E staining. So again, biologists, you should know this, hemotoxylin and eosin. And our traditional method that shows cell structures in blue and red in these H and E staining, right? So, and the second way that uh, these were prepared was using IHC, immunohistochemistry. So specifically looking at the GASP1 expression, which shows up as brown in these images. So as you can see on the screen, so the, the, this is basically a TMA, tissue microarray, and you see a whole bunch of these tissues. As I mentioned earlier, various stages, BPH and uh, uh, benign and uh, uh, can, various stages of cancer. Now, analyzing these samples can be tricky because what we're looking at is all these mixed colors. But there are tools where you can digitally separate these signals into in, uh, basically to individually analyze and quantify them from each, each of these three colors. So we published the Python code. So the Python code is available uh, uh, out there on my GitHub account and you can look for the link down under the description here and it's also referenced in the paper. Um, and and uh, it primarily uses 
you know, the Python code to separate the stains, it uses RGB to HGD conversion from SciPy. Nothing fancy, there's nothing, no deep learning, whatever, you don't need that to separate these colors, you know, simple RGB to HGD using the SciPy library in Python. Uh, and why do we need, we need to do this? Because think of like trying to count these brown dots in these IHC images on a blue background. It's much easier if you remove the blue entirely, right? So this technique helped us quantify exactly how GASP1 levels differ between the normal tissue, BPH, and uh, the cancer samples. So now let's look at some of the key findings. I'm scrolling through the paper. Uh, so look at this figure one now. So this is where uh, basically the research actually started, right? So you can find that GASP1, I mean, from this plot, GASP1 protein could be a game changer. Look, look at the graph. You can see there's a dramatic difference in blood GASP1 levels between all these different groups. So what's actually remarkable is that prostate cancer patients show blood GASP1 levels that are five times higher than BPH patients and 20 times higher than the healthy individuals. Now uh, let's scroll down to figure two where we looked at prostate tissue samples with uh, help of Dr. Rick Sideris uh, from Rutgers University. We developed something called the H-score. Why? To measure the expression of GASP1 protein, to basically quantify. Now we are visually seeing it. Now how can we quantify it? H-score to measure the expression of GASP1 protein. And this H-score, how do we quantify? It takes into account the consideration of both the color intensity and the size of these GASP, uh, GASP1 granules, which are proportional to the extent of GASP1 expression. Again, the color intensity and the size of GASP1 granules, uh, they're, they're taken into consideration to assign a H score. And as you can see here, there's a clear progression from normal tissue to BPH to prostate cancer. So what's particularly interesting here is how the scores differ between the early stage and advanced stage cancers. It's just now, I'm just talking about the cancer, early stage, advanced stages, and the scores differ. And why is that useful? Well, it potentially allows us to assess the progression of prostate cancer, not just uh, the cancer itself, but also the progression within the cancer stages. So in case you wonder about this Gleason grade three, four, and five, again, I, uh, most of you know, I come from uh, coding and you know, uh, not a deep background in this specific field. So I constantly uh, update myself on these various terminology and Gleason grade is something that was new to me, but obviously makes sense. Uh, three, four, five, these numbers reflect the aggressiveness and pattern of cancer cells when uh, when you view them under a microscope. So they range from three to five and three being the least aggressive and five being the most aggressive. Now let's scroll down to our uh, next set of uh, figures. Let's stop at figures three here and four. Let me show you what this looks like under this microscope, right? In normal tissue uh, and uh, BPH and GASP1 appears in very small amounts but in cancer tissue, it forms these distinct granules that are attached to these cell membranes, as you can see. It's like having a visual fingerprint of cancer progression. Now, if I scroll down again uh, in, in figure five, you'll see like here's, uh, here's actually a direct comparison between traditional H and D staining. Remember we mentioned about using both H and D and IHC. Now you can see between the H and E and our GASP1 in the IHC method, notice how GASP1 staining reveals details that are not easily visible with the standard technique, with the H and D technique. This is the reason why uh, we're proposing this IHC. Now, if I scroll down to, um, let's, let's stop. I mean, explaining this paper can take a very long time, right? I mean, it's got a lot of details. I'm just trying to make sure you get the main gist of this paper. And of course, you have the link down below to uh, read it at your own convenience. So let's stop at uh, figure seven for now. And as you can see, as cancer progresses, we see more GASP1 granules forming. 
Now, using the color separation technique, you can clearly visualize this progression. And in this image on the top is the original image because you see some blue over there. And the bottom is uh, uh, the, the, it's just showing the gas bond, which is just the brown. The top one has both blue and brown. And the bottom is just brown gas bond staining isolated from this image, digitally isolated, making it much easier to analyze these changes. Now, okay, so all that technical stuff is fine for those of you who do not come from exactly this background. What are the clinical implications, right? So what does this mean for patients? Well, think of GASP-1 as a complementary tool to PSA testing because PSA testing is, you know, you need that. And this is a complementary tool because by conducting both of these, PSA and GASP-1 blood tests together, uh, it could help doctors make more accurate diagnosis and greatly reduce the unnecessary biopsy procedures uh, based completely strictly on the PSA uh, level alone from the blood tests. So before ending, I just want to mention that we should note that this research is still in its early stages. We need of course, larger patient sample studies to further confirm these findings, but these initial results are so promising and could lead to better uh, prostate cancer detection in the future. And also by targeting GASP-1, uh, it, may, it may actually represent a major treatment option for prostate cancer and for, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, I can keep on talking about this, but uh, for more information, I think I should just refer you to take a look at this October 2024 issue of the, uh, of the journal Cancers, and the link is found below in the description. Thank you very much for, for watching this video, and I seriously hope you, you uh, read this paper and see if you are from image processing, image analysis, Python background and you're trying to see where the you know it is applied this is an amazing application where you can see how it can provide additional results that these researchers can use to validate their uh, findings that also come from other other means so thank you very much